Praise God. I'm sure unless you've been, you know, sleep for a day straight, uh, you've heard that Israel, Iran, who'd been singled out as running a proxy war against Israel through Hezbollah, uh, through Hamas, and so forth, and helping coordinate what happened on October 7th when hundreds of people were slaughtered. Uh, uh, you'd heard the news then, perhaps, I've talked about it a bit, that, that Iran was pulling the strings. Iran is a world power. Iran is an ally who's helped Russia make formidable strides within Ukraine by sending them all sorts of, not only working with them at a military level, but uh, also sending them drones and so forth. And then yesterday, the news came out, first time this ever happened, because Iran isn't next to Israel like so many other Muslims na Muslim nations, but they sent hundreds of uh, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, uh, drones to Israel. Uh, thankfully, I mean, they're one of our allies, and thankfully uh, we had moved fleets of ships there in case this escalates to world war, because keep in mind, Iran's allies are China and Russia, the greatest world powers on the planet, besides the United States, and they are opposed to us. They are dictatorships, as you know. Uh, and uh, they were worried about this escalating and potentially still into kind of a world, type, world three type scenario. Have you heard me talk about Iran and being an end time player? In the messages we've talked about over and over and over again. And it's, it's prophetic. I've warned you that this is not an accident that Iran is even in play right now, along with Syria and uh, Iraq being filled with Iranian uh, munitions and so forth. And I want to do a message because I think this is such a needed message right now. I was going to do part two of repentance. But I'll do that another time because I wanted to talk about Israel and the heresy of replacement theology. What is replacement theology? Taken to its extremes, it means that God is all done with the Jews. He's done with Israel. Israel isn't a nation before him as a, a people that are in his plan anymore. What happened in, on May 14th, 1948 is just a strange coincidence, you know, uh, uh, really strange coincidence for them. I mean, I don't know how they live with these understandings when they see what the scriptures say. You see the fulfillment of prophecy. But that the church is now Israel and that we have now received the promises of God from the Old Testament, and they don't apply to the Jews at all. They receive the curses, but the church receives the promises, and we fulfill the promises of Israel uh, now and in the millennial kingdom, but God's all done with the Jewish people as a people. It's all done with Israel. That is rank heresy. That is so contrary to the teaching of Scripture. It's called supersessionism as well, that the church has superseded Israel. Certainly, the prophecies in the Old Testament and bring the Gentile believers into the fold, amen? And Gentile believers, like wild olive branches, have been grafted into the olive tree, which is Israel, amen? Israel doesn't cease to be a people, and the church doesn't replace Israel in God's plan, as we'll see today. This is all very, very serious because bad theology leads to wrong living, leads to wrong decisions. In fact, the, the Holocaust and many of the ways in which the Jews were treated in the past uh, was based on understandings and teachings that the, the Jewish people, God's done with them. We could just eradicate them from the earth. Now it's taken to an incredible extreme, but that cost the lives of millions of people, amen? So we need to look at these things because right now as I speak, and I've warned you for years, I like some conservative radio, but I've warned you for years that when you listen to conservative talking heads who agree with our positions in areas, whether, you know, pro-life, you know, pro-traditional marriage, male-male, female-female, uh, things that are, in, you know, very uh, hot topics right now, transgenderism and so forth, we would agree as we're driving down the road with so many conservative pundits, amen? and what they say about traditional values and so forth. However, I've warned you for years, watch out though, that you don't just get caught up in the politics, that you're, you stay anchored in the word of God because these guys go off and they don't fear the Lord. And they say a lot of strange things sometimes. Well, now it happens that you have two leading lights in the conservative movement, Tucker Carlson and Candace Owens, both championing, you know, condemning Israel in their 
desire to eradicate Hamas. And Hamas is charter, by the way. And palace, the, the so-called Palestinian people were being uh, dictated by Hamas. Those, that's the ruling party uh, that basically sought to wipe out as many Jews as possible. Their charter calls for the elimination of Israel as a people. You know that, right? We've talked about that. I, uh, after October 7th, I quoted, and I've quoted it before, you know, uh, Hamas's charter calling for the destruction of, and the elimination of the Jewish people as a nation. I've also showed you that Muhammad is quoted in mosques all over the world, including here in the United States, as stating that in the end time, you know, the, the, the you know, trees will say, come and kill the Jew is hiding behind me, and so forth. And that the Muslims will destroy the, the cross, you know, Christianity, and so forth. And I shared many, many scriptures with you in the New Testament that indicate the end of days will be an Islamic caliphate. The Antichrist will have a whole lot of power through Islam. We've talked about that. You know, the first white horse rider is not Jesus in Revelation 6. He's the Revelation 19 white horse rider with the, with the, with the uh, sharp sword coming out of his mouth. Not the, bow, not the bow rider who goes forth conquering to conquer. That's the picture of the Antichrist. Well, the symbol uh, in Iran of their coming world rulership is the white horse. Uh, they cut people's heads off, which is what the Bible says in the book of Revelation will happen. Chapter 13. Strangely, they send gifts to each other after they murder innocent people. They blow up a bunch of innocent kids. They'll celebrate by sending gifts to each other. Not all Muslims, but many of them. And by the way, in Revelation chapter 11, it says when the two witnesses are killed, it talks about the Antichrist people will send gifts to each other to celebrate. I mean, there's just some really interesting parallels. And I'm not going to get all into Islam uh, today. I want to get into replacement theology a little bit and, and talk about God's plan and place for Israel in the end of days and how you really can't understand the end of time, can't understand the last days unless you understand Israel and that Israel is a big part of God's prophetic clock. Amen? Because Jesus said he'd be rejected by his own people. But keep in mind, he was also accepted by some of his people. The early church was all Jewish. Amen? Amen. So it's kind of weird to say the church replaced Israel when the whole early church in Acts chapter 15 had a council as to whether or not Gentiles could even become part of the Christian church. It was all Jewish at first. Amen? And that was part of God's plan. But God also had a plan in regard to Israel as a nation. But Jesus said not one stone would be sitting on the temple. Amen? But then he indicated that the temple would be rebuilt because then he talked about how after that, the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And that there would be a restoration of Israel, the nation. There's all kinds of prophecies. How Israel, would, Israel would become a nation again. And if you stand against that reality, you're not only denying Scripture in very important areas, but you're also siding with the spirit of the age, which seeks to eradicate Israel, tacitly at the very least. But you're also standing against God. If you stand against Israel's existence as a nation, you're standing against God. And they're part of the prophetic clock. Remember, Jesus talked about when you see the fig tree bud, right? We've gone into scriptures showing that the fig tree is a picture of who? Israel as a nation. We got into the scriptures and said this is their national symbol. And when they become a nation again, you're to, you're to keep your eyes open because the prophetic clock would begin ticking closer to midnight. And I've been telling you for a while now, I've been telling you, if, if you've, especially for those of you who've been into our ministry for years and years and years and years and years, you know, 30 plus years, I've warned over and over again of long before it became popular to warn about that the last day beast empire is largely Islamic based on the book of Daniel. And back in those days before 9-11, the Twin Towers going down everything, that was just kind of, you know, people just thought of Muslims over there having some oil and stuff, but they didn't see them in the end time scenario. And I've been saying that for years, not because I'm so smart, but because I have the word of God. And I see what it says in the book of Daniel. I see what it says in the book of Revelation and so forth. So it's very, very important. Crazy things have been happening. But Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. Yeah. 
He said there'd be earthquakes. Well, there's always been earthquakes. But he said earthquakes in diverse places, like <clears throat> back east, <laughs> with I think eight or more states filling that last earthquake they had. They're not used to earthquakes, you know. They're tripping out, you know. A lot of talk about the red heifers that were sent from Texas to Israel. Because if you're going to reinstitute the sacrificial system, which will happen according to Daniel chapter 9, the Jews will not only have a rebuilt temple, but they'll reinstitute the sacrificial system. You have to have the red heifers. To have a pure red heifer is hard to get. There were no red heifers in Israel. So like this is going to hold up us building the temple and having, you know, reinstituting the sacrificial system, who the Antichrist, by the way, sits in the temple and puts a stop to the sacrifices. And it's interesting that now some of those heifers are in Israel. Now, some say, this is it because the red heifers are there. Hey, I've been following the red heifer thing for decades, okay? These, these red heifers might die, okay, before the end comes. Just let you know, okay? Don't put your faith in red heifers. Amen. Put your faith in Jesus. But when you see the temple being rebuilt and there's red heifers, then you go, mm, oh, okay. Straighten up, man. <laughs> you know? Uh, but at the same time, it's very interesting right now. By the way, it's interesting because, you know, Texas says there's red heifers over to Israel. People in Hamas get all upset about that, by the way. Oh, and by the way, did you see, I mean, Iran was showing their missiles hitting Texas. You know? Fires everywhere in Texas because but they didn't say it was Texas. They go, look at the havoc that, this is in, I think it was their state media, you know, look at the havoc we're wreaking, wreaking, wreaking on, on Israel. This was last night, you know. Holly was sharing this with me. She's reading her, she goes, but they're showing fires that are breaking out all over Israel, but these are fires that just happened in Texas a little while ago. So they used the Texas fires. So if you're in Texas right now, don't run for shelter. I was just kind of tying something together. It's not kind of funny. Uh, so uh, evidently, uh, they were using the fires in Texas to say this is what's happened in Israel as a result of our rockets, you know. Guys, anybody old enough to remember Baghdad Bob? I got a Baghdad Bob over here. I got a Baghdad Bob over here. Any more Baghdad Bob people that you know about Baghdad Bob? A few, a few more. Come on. You could show your age. Mostly people with grayer hair. You know, not you, but me, a couple other people. Uh, that was when the United States had gone into, you know, uh, Iraq. And he was... Baghdad Bob was the representation. He represented Iraq, and it was just being decimated. And he's there saying, we're winning the war, as American tanks are going by back of him, you know, or at least fires and destructions happening. They were just such denial, and it's just a bunch of propaganda. Well, these people use constant propaganda. Not that our nation and our leaders don't use propaganda. Okay, stick to Jesus. Okay, trust him. Not any man not any government, trust the Lord and His Word. So we need to talk about some of these things. And it's very, very important. Uh, yeah, the red heifer fits into Bible prophecy, but we just don't know if it's these red heifers. Okay? But Joe, what if it is? Yeah, that, I'm always w looking, but I'm watching. But if they don't reinstitute the sacrificial system in at least some kind of makeshift temple, it becomes a moot point, right? So you got to watch the bigger picture as well. Because you're talking about all, everybody saying, this is a sign, this is a sign. Look at what the Bible says the signs are. Some of the signs are ha hatred toward Christianity. Jesus said, we'd be hated for his namesake by every nation. Is that happening now? Oh, and anti-Semitism. The Jews would be hated because we know every nation one day will go against Israel, the Armageddon, and destroy her. Is that happening around a lot of the world? Yeah, it's happening right in our own country. Can you imagine if the, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, the woke crowd was running the government and they're gaining more and more power. Many of them are very, very pro-Muslim and anti-Israel. Cortez and those gals, can you imagine if they were had the buttons on the, the nukes? Ooh, man. Or the fingers on the buttons on the nukes. Access to the nukes, that would be pretty crazy. So when we look at these things, it's important to keep in mind that God's Word warns that these things would take place in the end of days. There's a lot of end time things that we could point to and say, wow, knowledge has increased of God's word about the end times. Uh, technology has accelerated to where prophecies that could not be fulfilled, like the mark of the beast going out to everybody have to take a mark, or, uh, the name of the beast or the number of the beast to buy or sell throughout the world. That couldn't have happened even 30, 40 years ago. That there'd be an image of the beast 
that's made in his image that speaks to the people and causes people to worship the beast. That couldn't happen before AI, you know. Not, you know what I'm saying? Now we've got, yeah, have you seen the Tom Cruise deal where it looks just like Tom Cruise? He's jumping on the couch and everything, you know, on Oprah. They've got a Tom Cruise, I don't, think, I don't know if he does it like that, but they've got an AI that looks just like Tom Cruise, talks like him and everything. And this is just getting, you know, it gets kind of scary because people can make you say things you didn't even say and it sounds like your voice and everything. I don't know where this is all headed. It's pretty scary though. Now, uh, it's interesting. Let's start getting into the word together. Uh, in Daniel chapter 10, there's a war that takes place in the heavenlies, in the spiritual realm. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Amen. There is a spiritual war afoot. And as a non-Christian, I used to poo-poo that idea, think it was ridiculous that Satan was real and all that, and I rejected Christianity because I was a very, you know, I was such a learned 16-year-old, you know, that Christianity was a myth. And uh, then I opened myself up to those very forces I thought were a joke and began to become assaulted and actually used by demonic powers. And I, many of you know my testimony, I cried out to the Lord and he delivered me by his grace. And I was like, wow, this is very real. And when I opened this book, because I knew this was the book, because those powers were against this book. They were against the God of the Bible. They were against Jesus. I knew exactly who the Savior was because they, because my songs were all anti-Christ. I'm like, hmm, wow. And then boom, I opened this book and it talks all about this spiritual war. But it also talks about different powers that are over nations. Different powers, uh, principalities and so forth that, that have power over nations. And it's interesting because Gabriel, the angel Gabriel is at war. I mean, think, man, you think of boxing matches and who the best boxers are historically or MMA fighters. Well, man, you got angels that do hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then Gabriel is fighting against the prince of Persia. Not the human king, but the principality, the demonic entity that is over Persia. Persia is modern day what? Iran. Iran. Persia is typified in Daniel's vision by what animal? Does anybody remember? The bee, starts with the bee. The bear, right? In fact, in Revelation 13, you have this beast empire in the very end the antichrist empire looks like a lion and looks like a leopard but also looks like a bear that's iran okay and iran's been rattling its sabers it's called for eliminating israel from the planet you know the nation of israel wipe them off the map well the prince of persia would be the demonic entity over what is now known as iran the name was changed from persia to iran and gabriel is fighting against the prince of persia Yet he's not able to be victorious. He fights for three weeks. Wow. Look at verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But who? Michael. Michael. He's, the arch, he's an archangel. One of the, he's a chief prince. One of the chief princes, Gabriel says, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. So he's explaining to Daniel why he was late in answering his prayer about the restoration of the nation of Israel. That was the question about when are we restored to the land? The 70 years of captivity that was prophesied by Jeremiah the prophet, which he was just reading Jeremiah the prophet, Daniel. Those 70 years are up. Lord God, we humble ourselves before you. We deserve everything we've got. We deserve even worse. But our, the time is up. When are you going to restore us? And Gabriel's saying, hey, I would have been here sooner to answer your prayer but I was being held up by the prince of Persia. God, God unveils a little bit what's going on in the spiritual world to give us insight that there's demonic principalities over countries. You're not going to see this stuff on CNN that I'm talking about right now. 60 Minutes or even Fox News, okay? Or even Newsmax, okay? Uh, typically, I'd be surprised. you say, oh, no, they did a whole study on Daniel 12, 10, 13. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad to hear that, you know? But uh, it's interesting because Michael comes and helps. Why would Michael help in regard to Israel? Look at chapter 12, verse 1. What's his role? He has more than one, I'm sure. But look at J Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Now it's talking about the, just before the tribulation period, look what happens. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands, this is important, the great prince who stands what? 
guard over the sons of your people will arise. Who's Daniel's people? Israel. Daniel, we already find in chapter 10, verse 13, that Michael's one of the chief princes. Now we see here that he stands guard over who? What nation? Israel. The archangel Michael guards Israel from destruction. It's important to learn these things. And a lot of preachers, they believe you just have a couple verses on a Sunday, you go real light because there's new people. I love new people so much. I want them to see what the Bible says about all these things, you know. So praise the Lord. And I love old people too, like Mark and my, myself. And, and uh, I'll, I'll stop right there because I was already, I was roasting Mark today. He looks really, really, really good for 45, man. Good, good job, Mark. I just made up for it, bro. <laughs> now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. Now this is really interesting. Michael's going to arise and there will be what? A time of distress or tribulation such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be what? Rescued. Even though there will be great tribulation against Israel, Daniel's people, like never before, okay, worse than the Holocaust, guys. It's be horrific. Those who are written in the book will be rescued. By the way, when Jesus said, by the way, when this takes place, he goes on to talk about the, the time, times, and half a time, right? The time, times, and half a time, the three and a half year great tribulation period. Sometimes we call the 70th week of Daniel the 70th week of Daniel. That's technically what we should call it. But sometimes it's called the tribulation period. But really, technically, the last three and a half years when the Antichrist sits in the temple saying that he's God and it forces the mark of the beast, that's the second half of Daniel's 70th week. That's the three and a half year period. That's the great tribulation period. That's when this goes down. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, he warned his disciples, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, flee the mountains, right? Let those who are in Judea flee and so forth and pray that it's not on the Sabbath and so forth. And then you know what he said? For at that time there'll be great tribulation like there's never been before and there will never be after. Same thing. So it's very easy to find out what time period he's talking about here. It's at the great tribulation period. Yet wait, he's going to arise but doesn't say, give us any details as to what happens when he arises. And what's crazy is he stands guard over his people Yet when he arises, hell breaks loose on earth against God's people like never before. It seems almost counterintuitive to what you'd expect. You think at that time, Michael will arise and he'll beat the, with the devil's booty and he'll cast him in the lake of fire. That's not what it says. it says. It says there'll be tribulation like never before on God's people. That's because it's the beginning of the great tribulation that lasts three and a half years. In fact, Go to Revelation chapter 12. We're looking at the big picture, guys, today. The big picture spiritually, with regard to spiritual warfare that we are engaged in because you are part of spiritual warfare. Keep in mind, I mean, Daniel's praying. Did that affect spiritual warfare? Yes. Yeah. Michael came and assisted Daniel. I'm sorry, he assisted Gabriel. Hey, man. So Gabriel, go talk to Daniel. Your prayers are very, very important, you guys. There's a lot. Be sober. Be vigilant, the Bible says. For your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You ought to be standing, in, resist him in the faith, it says. You need to be praying. You need to be standing fast. You need to be involved in prayer because there are demonic powers arrayed against you and this church. Arrayed against our fellowships. You need to be praying for the, this fellowship. Please, I say pray for me. Protection, strength, that I can declare the word of God properly so people can be saved and strengthened. But pray for the entire church. Pray for all of us. Amen. Pray for your own walk. Pray for your own families because the Bible says we're not supposed to be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. Amen. And that we're put, supposed to put on the whole armor of God that we can stand against them. There is a spiritual war. And you're, that's why you're supposed to be sober and be vigilant. Sober as opposed to drunk. A drunk is an easy person for Satan to destroy and watchful just like you'd watch for a lion because he's like a roaring lion so devour you have a heads up spiritually ooh I think the enemy's trying to get me to fall here oh I think he's trying to hurt that person I'll pray for them amen the Bible says pray for all the saints as well so in Daniel 12 we see this but then in Revelation 12 look at verse 1 a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon 
under her feet and on her head a crown of what? 12 stars. Now, when you go to Revelation, and I'll have time to do all the cross-references for you. I just did this, by the way, in regard to just talking about spiritual warfare, not talking about Israel's future as much as spiritual warfare. At a men's retreat, we flew out to uh, Pennsylvania to do for the, our brothers back east, and we had a great time. But I went to Genesis chapter 35 and following, showing who is the woman with the 12 stars, sun of the moon. Anybody remember? Israel. Israel. Because who a dream? Who, who had the dream? Joseph, about 12 stars, sun and the moon, right? He's the 12 star, but 11 stars, sun and the moon, because he's the brother that all, everybody else is going to what? His mom, his dad, his, all his brothers, which represent, they're all the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Amen. They're going to they're bow down and worship him in the future. And they would literally come and bow down to him after he, they got wrecked, rejected him first, right? They tried to get rid of him. They threw him in a pit. They had him over the Gentiles. Just like they did with Jesus later, the descendants of the 12 tribes, threw Jesus in the pit, had him over to the Romans, the Gentiles. But Joseph rose to the right hand of power of the Pharaoh, just like Jesus rose to the right hand of God. And he gave bread to the world, right? But what's interesting, then the brothers came and they bowed down to him. Remember that? They bowed down to him. And what's crazy, what's amazing, is that wasn't totally fulfilled. It says 12 stars, sun and the moon. Well, the 12 stars, sun and the moon, they're going to bow down to who? the one greater than Joseph. Messiah ben Joseph. Messiah ben David. Jesus in the future. So we see the imagery in Revelation is taken from the book of Genesis and that Israel is still in play in the last days. They haven't been replaced. God still sees his people. Amen. Verse 1, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. By the way, Israel is depicted as a woman and the wife of Yahweh. Now he does divorce her under the old covenant because she rejects him. Amen? Amen. But he says he'll make a new covenant with her, not like the covenant he made with him at Mount Sinai. He goes on to say that, which he does. Through Christ, amen? amen. Because God becomes a man and pays for their sins that they could be saved from through the Old Testament and the sacrifices couldn't take away their sins, but God became a man. He took away their sins through his sacrifice on the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. So we read in verse 2, and she was with child. That woman with child, that's Israel's with child. Who's the child that Israel is going to have? Jesus, Messiah. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Okay. Then, verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might what? Devour her child. Now in Revelation, who is the dragon? You could read a few verses later, verse 9. He's called the dragon, the old serpent, Satan, and the devil, all in one verse. Those same titles are used of Satan in Revelation chapter 20 as well. It's the serpent of old, the dragon, the, the diabolos, the devil, the satanas, the Satan, the opposer, the one who is, he's a rat, he's a fink, okay? He's a narc. Why would anybody want to worship the biggest narc on earth? He accused the brethren day and night. I worship a tattletale. Oh, I'm really impressed. Okay? Because Satan's always trying to just bring everybody down with him. The last kind of entity you'd probably want to worship. At least the last one I would. I'd rather worship the God who made me, who loves me, who gave himself for me. Amen? Who created the heavens and the earth and will create a new heaven and earth and will reign with him forever and ever. Amen? That's a better deal. And it's a free gift, by the way. It doesn't cost you your soul for eternity, roasting and hell. Anyway, I digress a little bit. So, I just, devil worship is just stupid. It really is. Okay? And people that worship the devil, they, they're blind. Before I was a Christian, I was, didn't even realize I was worshiping the devil, and I was. It's right, songs glorifying him and everything. And then it says that the devil will be ridiculed in, Zechari- in Isaiah chapter 14, when it says that Lucifer will be brought down, and with him his musical instruments, with which it talks about how he deceived the world, the nations of the world. And they'll say to him, those, that are, those who are toast as well, those who are judged, being, who are damned to eternal punishment, they'll say to him, they'll say to one another, is this the one? that made the world like a wilderness? Like they're in disbelief. He had any, the only power he has is the power that God's given to him, guys. He'll be stripped of that power. 
as will every rebel ultimately, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I better get back to my notes. Okay. But God is good. Amen. So he got, wants to devour the child. I don't have time to read the entire chapter, but he's unsuccessful. Amen. Uh, the woman, uh, the, the child is born. Satan used Herod, remember? Remember the Christmas story? He energized Herod, the king, and put jealousy in his heart toward the coming Messiah, and he tried to eradicate Jesus as the child of the woman, the Messiah, but he failed. God had them flee into Egypt. But then he becomes enraged because he couldn't stop the Messiah. He couldn't stop redemption from happening. So now what does Satan do? He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy the Jews. But go ahead and look at verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a voice saying, or I heard a verse in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down he who accuses them before our God day and night. So Satan right now, he accuses us before God day and night. Amen? I mean, just look at what happened to Job, right? Satan was accusing Job before the Lord. Amen? In fact, the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? And how he, there's no one like him. And he, he maintains his holiness. And, and he fears me and, and turns away from evil. And then Satan accused me and said, he'll curse you to your face if you just let me at him, you know? And guess what? Job never cursed God to his face. He struggled. He wondered, like, why am I going through this? But God had a plan, amen? And sometimes you'll wonder why you're going through something, but the Bible says, consider the endurance of Job in James chapter 5. And how he's blessed twice as much in the end. Just hold on when you're going through trials, amen? Don't give up. When you're like, how could I be going through such a painful thing? <sighs> I always think of it this way. I deserve way worse than whatever I go through. I deserve hell forever. Amen? So anything compared to hell is a picnic. And I say, and then I say, you know what? I Lord, know, Lord, that you work everything together for the good, right? For those, those who love you, you know, those who are called according to your purpose, that you're going to work it for the good. And it says, the present sufferings are not to be compared with the glory that we revealed for us. Amen? You can't, and I always say, oh, can't even compare it to what he's going to do later. As a result of these sufferings, he works it all for the good. If I love him through it, Amen? And guess what? Actually, I deserve wrath, and this is just a trial. And God allows me to be blessed by trials because he loves me. Amen? And when you're going through a trial at work, when you're facing a trial with a spouse or a relationship you're in or you feel like you've been stabbed in the back or hurt, first of all, you need to acknowledge your side and say, what have I done? Is there something I've done that's sinful that I need to repent of? Amen? It's not always the other person's fault. But in this case, or your case, maybe this, it is their fault. Then you need to love them like Christ loved them. Amen? Pray for their salvation and just and be a good example and try to make things right through the Word of God. Amen? But so he's thrown down. There comes a time during the tribulation period, during the, I should say, the seventh week of Daniel, just before the last three and a half years, Satan's thrown down. He can't accuse us anymore. It says, rejoice, heavens, because the accuser brethren has been thrown down. But you know what it also says? I love this. Verse 11, and they, that's the believers, overcame him because of what? the blood of the Lamb, and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. We have victory through the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. And, and our testimony, our confession that He is our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we need to hold our confession until death. Amen. Because if we deny Him, the Bible says He will what? Amen. He will deny us. But if we confess Him before men, He will what? Confess us before the angels. Now look at verse 13. What happens when Satan's thrown down? And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the man, male child. When Satan is thrown down, who does he persecute? Israel, the woman. Why do you think he'd want to destroy Israel? Because you see, Satan cannot overcome God. He, he said, I will, be, I will ascend above the sides of the north. I will ascend above the throne of God. He wanted to be worshipped. Amen? Amen? Lord, already he lost his place in heaven long ago. But he's allowed to visit heaven as the accuser of the brethren, the prosecuting attorney, to accuse us. But eventually he'll lose that position as well as the prosecuting attorney. 
Verse 14. He hates the woman that's, or verse 13, he hates the woman who gave birth to the man child. Why? Because he wants to stop Bible prophecy from being fulfilled. Why? Well, one of the Bible prophecies is that he'll be thrown in the lake of fire forever and ever. That's why Revelation 20, verse 10. So if he could thwart Bible prophecy and destroy God's people, who would God come back to? That's why I can show you where in Scientology, OTH, which is the highest level of Scientology, uh, I have over three pages that was given to me by a Scientologist that left there. And then, uh, and then it came out years later. I'd been reading from it for years. Then it came out and it became admitted in a court case with Scientology. And they denied that it was theirs. But then guess what? Then they tried to stop it from, it from being read because they said, you can't read our material. Wait a minute. You denied it was yours. Now we can't read your material? Now you're admitting it's yours. And it was L. Ron Hubbard basically stating that the mission of Scientology, and he used to be a member of Crowley's Order of Templi Orientis, okay? He was working with uh, Jack Parsons, who was the leader of NASA's Jet Propulsion, or a founder of JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory for NASA. And Jack Parsons uh, was, wrote a book called The Book of Antichrist. You can read it online. The total crowd follower of Crowley and a member of his OTO, and he lived with L. Ron Hubbard. They brought in a woman, which is called their Scarlet Women. They're trying to bring forth the Antichrist, doing experiments. There's a, a crater on the moon, on the dark side of the moon, called, named after Jack Parsons, by the way. He blew up in a, a, with ro a rocket fuel uh, experiment. <laughs> but L. Ron Hubbard was his buddy before he became the founder of Scientology. And in that document, he says that the mission of Scientology could be characterized as a mission of Antichrist in the book of Revelation. And our role is to fulfill or to derail the second coming of Christ. And that's what a lot of cults and de demonically inspired movements are about, fighting Christ. Because in the book of Revelation, it says that the ten nations will give their power to the beast and they'll fight against the lamb at Armageddon. Revelation chapter 17. That's the spirit of this age. The spirits of demons, one out of the mouth of the beast, one out of the mouth of the false prophet, one out of the mouth of the dragon. Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. Go forth to the kings of the earth to bring them together against God at Armageddon. When they go, to, they march to Israel. This is all a demonic movement, guys, when you talk about the destruction of Israel and the destruction of Christians. And they're even going to try to fight against Christ at his second coming. If you're visiting, this is stuff you usually hear, is it? You know? <laughs> But this is truth, man. It's all documented. And of course, L. Ron Hubbard said, well, really, we're not fighting against Christ. It's an alien invasion that we're going to try to stop. So he tried to dilute his OT8s. I don't know if Tom Cruise and John Travolta and some of those guys ever made OT8. I heard that Tom Cruise had been, and I don't know about Travolta. You wonder how some of the biggest actors end up there? Anyway, verse 13 and when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished. Now, these two wings, that's, that's the scriptures tell us that God gave Israel the wings of eagles to bring them out of Egypt through, to, uh, out of, uh, you know, through the Red, Red Sea. So it's imagery using that God gave them supernatural strength, Okay. Not that there'll be this huge eagle comes from heaven and millions of people or hundreds of thousands get on its back. It's just, it's a biblical imagery. But notice she's nourished, the middle of verse 14, she's nourished for what? A time, that's one year, and times, that's two years, two plus one's three, and what? Half a time, that's the three and a half years. From the presence of the serpent. So when does he try to destroy her? And what does she do? She goes in the wilderness where God protects her for three and a half years. That's the great tribulation period. By the way, when Michael, the great prince, stands up, right, and all hell breaks loose like never before, Zech, Daniel chapter 12, the guard over God's people Israel, and then all of a sudden they're just <clears throat> great tribulation like never before, also called Jacob's trouble in the Bible. This coincides with what's happening right here in Revelation 12. You could draw a line from, Zech, from Daniel chapter 12 to Revelation chapter 12. They both talk about the three and a half years. They both talk about this great tribulation. And this is still future. How do we know it's future? Because it's at the end of the three and a half years that who comes back? Jesus Christ. And it says the beast will be taken, and with him the false prophet. And they'll be thrown alive in the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 19. This has not happened already. This is yet future, obviously. 
Verse 15, and the serpent, now the dragon is called the serpent, same entity, poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, which could be soldiers, artillery, munitions, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman. It's funny, man. The New Agers are worship the earth. We worship Jesus. But guess who helps us in the end? The earth. Thank you, Jesus. Not thank you, earth, but thank you, Jesus. Okay? Uh, but the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. That might be like what happened to Korah or something. Think about that. So, verse 17, so the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold their, the testimony of who? Jesus Christ. Amen. Who's that? That's us. Amen. Then he goes after the church. But we have the promise. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not what? Prevail against it. Now, we won't win that war against the Antichrist, but it's battles. The war really ends when Jesus comes back, and then we win because we're caught up, and then we come back with him. And we, really Jesus, but we're with him, defeat the Antichrist, and he sets up his kingdom. Amen? So, and by the way, you'll see the, did anybody see in Revelation chapter 12 where it also mentions the amount of days that the woman's in the wilderness? You just can look at the text. Anybody see it? Yep. How many is 1,206 days? How many, how, many days? how many years is that? Do the math. Three and a half years. Oh, in Revelation chapter 13, the very next chapter, verses 5 through 7, it talks about the beast will wage war against the saints, and it says he'll reign for, and it tells us months, 42 months. Just, God just spells it out for us over and over again, so you don't have to wonder, <clears throat> why does God do it that way? Time, times, and half a time. Because Daniel was sealed, <clears throat> right? Revelation is not sealed. He's letting us know that time. A lot of people thought it was three and a half years. Yeah, it's three and a half years based on other numbers in Daniel. Then you see in the book of Revelation, it's 1,260 days, you see. And it's also uh, uh, 42 months. It's a three and a half year period. And we know that his reign is terminated when Christ comes back at the second coming. And by the way, if you've ever wondered who the restrainer is, yeah, who just gave that away? You're right. That's right. If you ever wonder who the restrainer is, Paul says that the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? He says, concerning Christ's coming and our being gathered together to him, the rapture. Concerning Christ's coming and our being raptured, the rapture. He says, don't be deceived. That day, what day? The rapture will not take place until two things happen first, right? What? The falling away will happen, right? And the Antichrist will be revealed in the temple, showing himself that he is God. Those two things will happen. And then it says uh, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 8, I'm sorry, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. It's the second coming. The rapture is at the second coming, not seven years earlier. Paul warns clearly, don't be deceived into thinking that the rapture is before two events, the falling away and the Antichrist sitting in the temple. Then he shows the second coming, the parousia, uh, when Jesus returns to defeat the Antichrist. But there's an interesting verse right before verse 8 and verse 7. Uh, Paul says in verse 5, I'll back up a little bit. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in the time he will be revealed, so that in his time he will be revealed. Listen to verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, he, who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed. Who is the one that is protecting Israel? Michael. Who's protecting Israel from tribulation? And only when he casts Satan down and steps back. Woe to the earth, it says in Revelation, by the way, at that time. Rejoice, heavens, because salvation's come. The accuser of brethren is cast down, but woe to the earth, because it'll be this great tribulation. He's a restrainer. He's the one that holds back the force of darkness, just like he held back the prince of Persia. You understand? Are you absolutely sure he's a restrainer? I'm 99 point something. <laughs> I don't want to, it doesn't say, the restrainer is Abraham, I'm sorry, is uh, Michael the archangel. So I don't want to say absolutely, but I don't, I don't know a better candidate. No, it's the church, and the church is raptured. That makes no sense. Because Paul just said, don't be deceived to think the rapture will happen before the Antichrist. Then he turned around and said, but the Antichrist can't come until the, the church is taken. That wouldn't make sense. By the way, he says he, not her, the bride. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Oh, the He is the Holy Spirit in the church. No, the Holy Spirit's not taken from the earth. How do you know? 
Revelation, or Matthew 13, Mark 13, Jesus says during the tribulation period, don't premeditate what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you utterance. Amen? Amen. And you can't be born again unless you're born of the Spirit. He has to be here. Amen? Amen. And the prophets, two witnesses prophesied for 12 or 6 days by the Holy Spirit. Okay. There's no scripture that says the Holy Spirit's taken off the earth. Anyway, I digress a little bit. Now, Israel is definitely a huge part of God's end time plan, obviously. Hey, Satan hates the woman. And you could read in Revelation chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, where one of the judgment is, judgments, trumpet judgments is held back and says, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Boom. Revelation 14, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name in their, uh, in the, uh, and their name on his father written on their foreheads. And it goes on. Revelation chapter 21, verse 12, New Jerusalem that comes down from heaven, and had a great high wall, had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the, at, and at the gates 12 angels, and the names were written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. God is not done with Israel. Read the Bible. Amen? So when you have even conservative pundits that people have just adored because they agree with us on a lot of issues coming out saying, oh, you know, you know uh, Israel shouldn't be trying to root out Hamas. They should let them just exist and fester and become what they were again. That's basically what they're saying. And then when you have many of these people, because Tucker had a priest from Jerusalem talk about this, and the priest from Jerusalem was saying, calling it a genocide, you know? In fact, uh, in the Jerusalem Post, it says, it quotes Tucker Carlson as saying, and I had liked a lot of things Tucker said in the past, and I agreed with certain things Candace had said. I'm like, uh, oh, you guys are going over the line here, and I was worried about that. But who's going to turn and all of a sudden side with the Muslims in the end against Israel, you know? And to one degree or another, they appear to be doing that. And uh, I mean, Candace Owens lost her position on Daily Wire and was let go by Ben Shapiro's uh, group, Daily Wire. He's a Jew. And he, he said he'd love to debate her on the subject on Israel. Oh, but she just declined the debate, you know? Uh, and Tucker said that Christians who support Israel's war against uh, Hamas are lost the thread, you know. No, I think you've lost the thread that the scriptures tell us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, there'd be a war between the seed of the woman, right, and the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent would bruise the seed of the woman's heel. Jesus was bruised, amen. He died on the cross for us. Metaphorically, his heel was bruised. Literally, his heel was bruised, bruised okay. When you study forensic science, his heel would be bruised because of where the blood would clot up the heel. Interesting. But guess what also happens there is you have the prophecies that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Amen? And, that's, and so Jesus does. But the seed of the woman, who, who the woman, I mean, who's the Messiah going to come through? God chooses Abraham. Abraham was a Gentile. There were no Jews. He chooses Abraham and he leaves his Terah, his father, or idol worshiper like everybody worshipped idols comes out of there and God promised to make him a great nation amen? amen shows him the boundaries of the nation and says that through your seed his people's seed Abraham's seed through Abraham the nations of the world be blessed we're blessed I don't care what nation you're from if you've embraced Jesus as your Lord and Savior amen? amen you have victory over the serpent through the shed blood of the seed amen that's why Satan tried to destroy the seed of the woman in Revelation 12 are you with me that's all part of this spiritual war we're talking about. But it gets crazier. So Tucker's lost the thread of prophecy and what the Bible teaches. If you just look at things geopolitically and what best helps America, and you begin to worship America rather than the God who created us, you lose the thread. You lose the truth of what God's Word is saying. And you can become very dangerous because you're influencing many people. That's why I would tell Candace and Tucker, uh, you know, Jer Jer you know, James chapter 3, verse 1, let not many of you seek to be teachers, for you will have a stricter judgment. You start teaching theology, you better make sure you know what you're talking about. Uh, there's been a lot of, a lot of uh, supersessionists, a lot of 
those who've taught forms of replacement theology. Uh, in fact, the name of the Jerusalem Post, I was looking at this article last night. Jerusalem Post, uh, uh, where you've lost the thread to U.S. Christian leaders who support Israel, Tucker Carlson says, right? That's the headline. Tucker Carlson invited Palestinian Christian Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac to discuss the situation in Gaza and attack Christians who support Israel's war in Gaza. That's what it says in the Jerusalem Post. Uh, Jerusalem Post also says Carlson highlighted Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's commitment to continue in strikes until Hamas, the terrorist group responsible for the October 7th massacre in which over 1,200 people were butchered and around 250 were taken into Gaza as hostages is completely eradicated. In other words, he's against that. He's siding with the, the woke liberals on that, Tucker is. So it's really interesting when you look at what the Bible says about all this, though. And we need to be aware. I know who's listening to what to a degree, not you specifically, but I know what Christians are listening to. And we rejoice in sometimes a lot of what conservatives say, but I've been warning you for years and years. Be careful, man. Make sure you're more into the Bible than the news. Amen? Make sure you're more into God's Word than the news. Do you spend more time in God's Word or do you spend more time listening to the news? Secular news. Oh, yeah, but I, but I listen to a lot of good people like Candace and Tucker. Be careful. Because they could be right on in areas, but often others. Test everything. Hold fast to that which is good. Amen? This is important. In fact, what does God's Word say? Go to Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, Paul says in verse 1, he's going to tell us about Israel and how we have to be very, very careful. I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. He says, my conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed. Paul says, I wish I was cursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. He's talking about Israel, who are the Israelites to whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises who are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh because he's a seed that came from Abraham who is overall God blessed forever amen look at Romans chapter 10 verse 1 brother my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their what salvation for I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according with knowledge. I mean, they didn't understand who the Messiah was. Now, not all of them missed the boat, right? Because guess what? Paul himself is a Jew, amen, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, and all the early Christians, as we, as we noted, are, are Jews, amen? And God wasn't done with them. He said he'd bring them back as a nation again, and he did, Amen. Now what's interesting is God prophesied that that would happen. When you're witnessing the non-believers, it's great to show them prophecies because the history of Israel, as you know, there's been hundreds of different nations. There's a couple hundred right now. There's been hundreds of other people groups through the years that have just vanished. But there's only one people group that has had these prophecies given to them and fulfilled these prophecies about cease to be a nation and becoming a nation again. And that's Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 10. Listen to this. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands afar off, and say... He who scattered Israel will gather him. Catch that. He who what? Scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. I've been putting up with this for years. It's really sad to watch, but I used to listen to the Bible Answer Man. You know, uh, the great Dr. Walter Martin, amen? And he talked about this coming Antichrist tribulation period being the future. And then he died, and he got replaced by a guy named Hank Hanegraaff. And Hank Hanegraaff started saying, oh, the prophecies have already been fulfilled. He wrote a book called The Last Disciple and said that Nero was the Antichrist. You know, the end times of the book of Revelation talks about, oh, it's been fulfilled. Almost all of that's been fulfilled. The Antichrist, that's already happened. Really, Nero was the Antichrist? Uh, Nero, uh, and you can't, you know what? The Bible says the Antichrist will be killed when Christ comes back. Amen? Right. Revelation chapter 19. Right? Guess what Nero did? Did Nero get killed by Christ at Christ's second coming? No. Nero committed suicide, guys. The fact of history. He was not the Antichrist. Did Nero cause everybody to take a mark on the right hand or forehead to buy or sell? 666? No. It's just ridiculous. And I'm like, what happened to the Bible Answer Man program? And then he'd have a guy on there named Gary DeMar. And Gary DeMar is a leading preterist teacher that says most of the end already happened. The Antichrist, that's all past. And he'd get invited. I'm like, poor Walter Martin. He's not here to shoot this stuff down, you know. Just 
rank false teaching. And you know what Gary DeMar said about this passage in Jeremiah 31 10? Because he's saying, no, Israel being a country, they're not God's favored people anymore. He doesn't have a plan for the Jews as a nation because the end's already pretty much happened. And what does he do with Jeremiah 31 10? Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare in the coastlands afar off and say, he who has scattered Israel will what? Gather him and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. You know what he said? The scattering is literal. But the gathering, it's not literal. That's just spiritually. You know, a lot of Jews will come to Christ, but it has nothing to do with them coming back in the land. That blows me away that he says that. Why? Well, because the scattering is literal, but the gathering is just spiritual. Because look at a few verses later in Jeremiah 21, 23, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, once again they will speak this word in the land of, in the land of Judah and in its cities when I restore their fortunes. Back in the land of Judah. Amen. The gathering is literal, folks. Thus saith the word of God. By the way, God doesn't want Gary DeMar to get his grubby hands on the Bible and deny Israel's future because he goes on to say right after that in verse 35, Thus says the Lord, listen to this, who gives the sun for the light by day. Ooh, he gives the sun for light by day. And the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night who stirs up the sea and, the, uh, and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, check this out. If this fixed order, what? The sun, the moon, the stars. If it departs from me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Hey, Joe, can you move over there real quick and just turn the lights off real fast? Just over there. Third one down. We'll get most of them. I just want to I just want to just see what we've got. Uh, turn the other one off too. Right in front. Yeah, there you go. Uh, those are emergency lights. They stay on. Is the sun still shining, guys? Therefore, God is not done with the nation of who? Israel. Amen. You can turn it back up. We proved it. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. Now, in Romans chapter 11, Paul talks over and over again about Israel. Romans 11. Look at verse 11. I say then, ha, uh, did uh, not, uh, I, I say then, they did not stumble, that is Israel, so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles, that's to us, to make them jealous. Okay? He goes on to say, Now, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their what? Fulfillment be, meaning they're going to come back to the Lord. Verse 13, But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their what? Acceptance be but life from the dead. Okay? Then he says, look at verse 16. If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is holy, and the root is holy, the branches are too. Look at verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, that's the Jews... Some were broken off. And you being a wild olive, meaning we're Gentiles, we're not even natural branches of the olive tree. And, and you being wild the olive, were grafted in among them and become partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. Don't be arrogant toward the Jews that were broken off. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. I mean, you're a wild olive, olive branch. You shouldn't even be here, man. They were the natural ones. Don't be arrogant against the Jews. Oh, God's done with the Jews. God's done with Israel. Verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I may be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Don't be what? Do not be what? Conceited but fear. You know what? Most people that are really strong in replacement theology, supersession, say we're the chosen people now. We're the church. We're God's people. God's done with Israel. You know what they say? They also say, and we can't be cut off. We can't forfeit our salvation. We're in no matter what. God's done with them. It's exactly what Paul warned about. He said, don't think that God's done with them, right? And he says, don't think that you can't be blotted out or cut off. Verse, four, verse, verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches of the Jews, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be what? cut off. And they also, the Jews, they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, huh, will be grafted in what? Will be grafted in. For God is what? 
able to graft them in again. Watch this now, verse 24. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, how much more will these, the Jews, Israel, who are the natural branches, be what? Grafted into their own olive tree. Verse 25. For I do not want you, to be, brethren, to be uninformed by the way, every time you see the New Testament say, don't be ignorant or don't be uninformed, you'll see that's where a lot of the church is ignorant or uninformed because the Holy Spirit knew it was coming. Do not be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Get a chosen person complex. That partial hardening has happened to Israel. Not all Israel. I mean, Paul, there's Jews that are saved right then. They wrote the New Testament. That partial hardening has happened to Israel until what? The fullness of the Gentiles has come until the last Gentiles get saved. And verse 28, look at this. And so what? All Israel will be what? All Israel will be what? Amen. Saved. Underline that. Circle that. Put an asterisk by that. All Israel will be saved, just as it's written. The deliverer, that's Jesus, will come from Zion. He will move, un remove ungodliness from Jacob. That's Israel. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That's an Old Testament prophecy that all Israel will come to the Messiah in the end. And Jesus says, you won't see me to the Jews. Again, who, were, who, who crucified him until you say what? Say what? Blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then you go to Zechariah, in the Old Testament, what does it say? It says all the nations will surround Israel, but they'll be, whoever tries to mess with Israel, they'll be destroyed. And then guess what it says? It says, then the Jews will see the one that they pierced. And they'll mourn for him, mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. It mentions the, different, the 12 different tribes all weeping because they realize they pierced their Messiah. This is the Old Testament. Then in Zechariah 13, 1, it goes on to say, then a fountain of cleansing will be opened to them. Amen? And in Zechariah 14, it says, that Armageddon will take place, and Christ will come back to the Mount of Olives, and all the eyes and the tongues of those standing up during this war will be just consumed out of their sockets while they're standing up. That's intense fire. That can happen right now through uh, nuclear weapons. It can happen also at Christ's second coming. And they're going to lop their weapons on each other, we read in the Scripture. So we want to make sure that we are sticking close to Jesus. Amen? Amen? And look at verse 28. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies. Meaning the Jews right now, they oppose the gospel. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies. Paul acknowledges that for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, because of his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he hasn't rescinded his promise. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are what? Beloved for the sake of the what? Fathers. For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Okay? I like to say irrevocable. That's not the pronunciation. It's irrevocable, but it sounds so much better. Irrevocable. King James is unrepentant. Verse 30. For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disbelief or disobedience, so these also, the disobedient Jews, now have been disobedient, but because of the mercy shown to you, they also may be what? They also now may be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he what? May show mercy to all. Oh, the depths and the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and unfathomable his ways. God's deep, man. Verse 34. For who has known the mind of the Lord, and who became his counselor? Or who is first given to him that he, it might be paid back to him again? Verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory, the glory forever. Amen. How blessed and awesome is that, guys? What an awesome God we have. Amen. Amen. Is God done with Israel? No. no. Pray for these guys that are teaching these heresies. They're teaching these false teachings. They're helping ferment the hatred among the Muslims because guess what? If God does not, did not choose Israel and doesn't have them as a nation, isn't, then you could argue to, that the Muslims, oh yeah, might as well just take them over. Might is right, I guess. No, that's not the way it works, man. God is right, and he is the Almighty. Amen. Hey, Joe Schimmel here. We want to thank you for watching. We want to also encourage you not to forget to sign up or subscribe 
to Good Fight Ministries YouTube channel. We have the most amazing content. We also have the very popular Good Fight radio show where we examine all kinds of things in light of scripture, as well as 511 News, which is also very eye-opening. And we also have mind-blowing video exposés that you won't see anywhere else. And our 24-7 online radio station, the Good Fight Radio Network, as well as my sermons from Blessed Hope Chapel over on the Blessed Hope Chapel YouTube channel. So thanks again. We'll see you later. And we just pray that the Lord blesses you richly as you seek his face. And this week's featured product is Wrestling with Discipleship. You can get it at wrestlingwithdiscipleship.com, goodfight.org, or amazon.com.